2022 has been one of the the most challenging years that you know I faced career wise. I had opportunity to go up in the company, but you know so much stress comes along with it. And no one knows this, but you know we're we're literally getting you know kicked out. Someone bought the whole block. So you're dropping that right now for the first time. For the first time, oh, yeah. Goodness. They right. bought the entire block, so and increased the rent for the space for like six thousand dollars and. Who gonna have uh, the money to pay for that? Uh, even you know, closer family members just you know yeah, yeah. things just happening uh-huh. that we never faced before. So you know, from a uh, point of, uh, point of view of like mental hygiene and psychological things, how can we create a fun habit? You know, in situations like that when you're dealing with so much. Yeah. So, you know, especially with family stuff, like how much of this is just relationships of convenience that if I really look at it, mm-hmm. it's just not serving me anymore, you know, and, and you cut it out. And yeah. so those things are heady things. You don't fix them overnight. Right. You know, this isn't trite advice. Right. Right. But once you start to do that and then you start to realize that when I'm having a better time, I'm a better version of myself. And then with regards to work, I think it's trying to figure out what are the boundaries. Like, how has it, you should never spend every night till the end of the night working, right? So there's something problematic there. And, you know, Mm -hmm. each person's situation is going to be different. Mm -hmm. But like, how much of that is admin time where if there was a way to either time block doing that, you know, in batches, right. you know, so that you're not task switching all the time. Yo, 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 welcome to the Highest Point Podcast. This is a podcast for everyone, no matter where you're from, no matter what you've been through, you know you deserve the best and willing to put in the work for progress to reach the highest point. And speaking about reaching the highest point, we have a gentleman in the building today who embodies that lifestyle. He's a father. He has a Ph.D. in psychology. He has an ideology that can help transform your life. We're speaking about the author of The Fun Habit, How the Pursuit of Joy and Wonder Can Change Your Life. We'd like to welcome Mr. Dr. Mike Rucker to the show. How you doing today? I'm What's doing up, well. I'm doing well. Thanks for having me. <laughs> Just quick clarification, organizational psychologist. Organizational psychologist. <laughs> clinical, clinical psychologists get a little bit funny when you, you know, because uh, I think. What's that, the difference? Like, can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, yeah. definitely. Look, clinical psychologists tend to treat mental illness and, you know, they have to go through clinical hours and organizational psychologists tend to be social psychologists and kind of treat broad population health mm. and uh we go through a practicum which is different so just uh okay yeah. so is it that way i'm not pissing off anybody right yeah yeah we got we got to make sure that's clear <laughs> so we do what you do is that anything that can help when it comes to like uh therapy like mental health anything like yeah, that yes so i'm looking more at like um mental hygiene so i'm not mm. trying to treat the individual but um still you know confidently broad-based interventions, my background's in workplace wellness. So, oh, wow. you know, how can you go into, uh, you know, what we call a population, like an employee population of a certain uh, business and, right. you know, make them well, you know, whatever that is, either through mental interventions or a lot of times, um, especially in my day job, physical interventions, like how can we get people to be more active or things Absolutely. like that? So what, what's your what's your day job? What 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 type of work do you do? Well, so I'm on sabbatical right now. So my mm-hmm. job right now is the book for sure. But mm-hmm. uh, in the last 10 years, uh, I was in Cedar Lead, excuse me, senior leadership for active wellness. Mm. Um, and it, we did exactly that. We would generally go in and put in like a fitness center. or And now, you know, fitness is kind of a subset. We call it a wellness center. Do things like, you know, uh, yoga, create fitness regimens, help folks do these, um, you know, fitness challenges for their corporation, right. anything that really gets people healthier that kind of, you know, treats them outside of their work day. Gotcha. Yeah. So you, you kind of help people develop habits that would be beneficial in the long run. Yep. That's exactly right. Yeah. Okay. That's that mental hygiene piece, yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. uh, the, it's also feels kind of like, uh, having to create a preventative space, so. Yeah, I think that's right. We're trying to get ahead of things, right? Oftentimes we call that getting upstream. So many things are to treat deficits, right? When something's already broken. Mm-hmm. And unfortunately, that just takes a lot of time, but we're not being mindful, right? right. Like, and I, I know that's what we're going to get into. into. Mm-hmm. And that certainly was the inspiration for the book is that when I was doing my doctoral work, I realized that 
having control over our time, I use the the term autonomy mm -hmm. is such a big piece. And so a lot of us, even it, you know, if we're driven from a sense of duty, we will just work, work, work and not realize that, you know, after six months, if you're feeling burnt out, you can't show up as the best version of yourself. Right. Mm, yeah. so and so true. you're not able to work. And so the whole thing kind of falls apart. And, mm. you know, in the nineties, we kind of talked about it before we started rolling we like champion people that didn't sleep, right? Yeah. They like yeah. grinded it out and like, you know, you would wear as a badge of honor, like, hey, I only got 20 hours of sleep this week. Yeah. You know, even the most staunch folks that were saying that, like the Gary Vaynerchuks of the world, yeah. mm -hmm. yeah. have completely rolled that back because we now know after years and years of empirical research, people that aren't sleeping don't produce anything because the wheels fall off. Yeah, eventually. burned out. Yeah. And so my thesis with the fun habit is that we're learning the same thing is true for leisure. Like if you're not doing anything outside of your work so that you feel fulfilled and you feel like your life is worth living, mm -hmm. then you, you don't, you know, everything starts to fall apart eventually anyways. And so, you know, this work life balance was too weird because we were creating these buckets and we almost turned work life balance into a job. Right. And so mm -hmm. like, yeah, that was, you know, people were doing it pragmatically and kind of following other people's recipes and it wasn't inward bound. It was all outcome focused, like, you know, and so really, you know, as a first step, like, what is it that I really want? You know, right. how am I living a mindful life and a deliberate life seems yeah. to sort of be the secret sauce. So. Absolutely. Absolutely. And even, um, you know, just speaking about that, we're going to get much more in depth with the book, but something, uh, one thing that's, uh, really important on our show we like to get into the journey of our guests so sure. many times people see the end result they <laughs> see you at this space of just like zen right <laughs> but and i don't i'm not saying i'm there yet. yeah right and, but we know like even in your journey we know you haven't been here from the beginning right, right so can we get a little bit of background about okay where you're from and kind of your family dynamics growing up yeah yeah so my my origin story was um, I was, you know, probably had some early success, probably, I mean, you know, it's all relative, right? But I had some relative early success as an entrepreneur. And so that made me pretty cocky. Mm -hmm. And also during that time, uh, so that this time is like the late nineties, early two thousands, I really got into peak performance. I have this mentor, he's an amazing guy by the name of Michael Gervais. His claim to fame is, uh, he's the mindfulness coach or was he, he doing other things now, but for quite some time, he was Russell Wilson's uh, mindfulness coach for oh, okay. the Seattle Seahawks. Okay. Uh, he's solid mentally. It seems like, yeah, yeah. Oh, he was right. He's yeah. having the best year. <laughs> <laughs> and Wilson went down hard. <laughs> and that's my, because he's not working with Mike anyways. Mm. <laughs> but anyways, I don't know if I name dropped him. His name's Michael Gervais. And so if you, you know, Google his name and Russell Wilson, all this stuff will come up and he's got an, interesting podcast himself called finding mastery where he kind of picks apart um, how people have, you know, gotten into their swim lanes. But so I was learning from him early on, you know, similar to Gary V he's, you know, what I learned from him at the time has, has sort of shifted. Um, and, uh, but I was also really into the quantified self movement. And so for folks that don't know what that means, it's really paying attention to like every aspect of your life and, and, and like writing it down, right. Did I have a good day on a scale of one to 10, you know, mm. mark it down. And like, so I was picking apart everything and really trying to chase happiness for quite some time, like really for quite a while, like, Hey, how can I, you know, quote unquote, optimize my life for happiness. And that was sort of working for, for quite a while up until about 2016. Mm -hmm. um, and then unfortunately my younger brother passed away quite suddenly. From, oh, sorry, uh, to, hear sorry that. to hear that. Uh, thank you. Um, from a pulmonary embolism. And so, and then uh, I had been a runner for quite some time as well. It was the way I mitigated stress. Like if I was ever stressed out, I'd just go and, you know, jump on the road, put on some music. And like, it was almost like medicine, right? I'd come right. back and feel good. Um, I found out that I had advanced osteoarthritis quite suddenly, and that I was going to need to get a hip replacement in, in my 40s. What? Which, oh. yeah, it was crazy. So, so here's this, you know, way that I mitigated stress. It was taken away from me yeah. and found, you, you know, that for a while. yeah. And then also realizing like, oh, sh you know, bad things happen to good people. But I was still trying to chase happiness. And the more I tried to like will myself to be happy, the more I was 
obstacles mm. coming. <laughs> yeah, and I was making myself yeah. miserable. Yeah. And so I was like, okay, what's happening here? All these tools that had been helpful, you know, mindfulness, gratitude journaling, you know, all of these things, the more I was trying to apply them to, to make them work, they were making me identify as unhappy, like getting close to the side of clinical depression, right? right. Mm. Yeah. And so I was like, okay, if this isn't working, what can I do? And, you know, I had just finished my doctoral work. So, you know, being a good academic, I went and tried to find answers there. And there was this emerging research that, that I found. This comes from a researcher out of Cal. Her name is Dr. Iris Mouse. That, but it's been replicated that, especially now in the Western world, the folks that are like overly concerned about how they're doing all the time, that rumination, that's where... You, that that's the bad output that's like leading to these crazy things. You're not taking any action. You're just wasting your time overthinking all the time. Mm. Like, why am I not where I want to be? Right. Like happiness right. is off on this horizon and I'm here and you start to identify with that gap between where you are right now, mm. which is amazing. You're alive doing the stuff that you want to do to this like thing that doesn't really exist. Right. 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 Yeah. And that's a space where anxiety lives and, so, okay, so th I understood that, but so what can you do about it, right? That's a thing, but it's not really like you can take action. Right. And so I, I, I kind of dug into this and we alluded to it at the very beginning. It's like, I've really lost a lot of control over my life. Instead, I'm just like worried and worried about what other people are doing, worried about myself. Mm -hmm. Like, why don't I just stop all that and, and realize that I can just start scheduling things that I enjoy into my week? You know, especially if I do it deliberately and it's not easy. First, you need to take the, you know, the first step of going, okay, what in my life isn't working? Which right, is right. so hard for people, right? We're a society, especially in the West, where it's like anything that's going to make things better means I need to add stuff on, right? And so like mm. the important magical first step is taking a step back and going, wait a second, doom scrolling for two hours a week. It's not really suiting me. Like well, that's a poor use of my time. Yeah. But, you know, these two hours where I'm kind of, you know, this activity of introspection where I'm writing in my journal, just like, oh, I wish I was somewhere else. Why don't I spend those two hours being where I want to be instead of thinking about it? Right. Right. Exactly. Right. And yeah. so all that sounds simple, but so many of us don't do it unless someone's nudge us in that direction. And so I'm yeah. um, at that. That's the backstory is that. You know, I, I thought I had it all sorted out. I think a lot of us do until we don't, right? Mm -hmm. And then what do you do from that point? And so, you know, it's really, you know, it's it's really a book about how do we live where our feet are. Right. Yeah. Now, now I want to dive into the situation because I know that you lost a younger brother yeah. um, due to a pulmonary embolism. That 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 hits me um, hard because my wife, she had a pulmonary embolism. Oh, my goodness. Um, did she make it through? Yes, she did. I'm glad and did. Uh, it was a very, very scary moment because the doctors, you know, they, they didn't really have much there. Uh, when they presented the information to us, you know, it was it was kind of hard to hear. You know, sure. they're just like, yeah, she can die. And, you know, just like it's like nothing. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, um, and Is you she know, on Warfarin now? Or like, uh, well, that's she not was my on. Business anyways, yeah, sorry. no, 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 no. You're good. Like, because I had to, because uh, I was, and, you know, Injecting the medicine in her, yeah, yeah, uh, for probably I, a year. I had to take it for the reason I asked, is, um, because of my brother's death when I got the hip replacement. Mm -hmm. You know, now you have a family history, right? So mm -hmm. I have to be mindful of it as well. So yeah. that, that's why I was yeah. just, you know, so, so I know those injections. I had to do in my stomach. Come on. Yeah, exactly, <laughs> yeah. exactly. So you know, we done that for a while. Like, man, we was uh, like putting the needles in this jar, and then like, cause, cause I like to, we like to do things like, okay. We want to kind of like measure, you know, and have a like to look back on things like, look, we made it through this and then kind of reflect on it. Like, look, remember we did this. We can make it through anything, you know. So we had all of those needles in this big jar as a, something to remember, like was something that we faced. You know what I mean? So you're going to love the book. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry I didn't bring two. I'll make sure you go on two. But uh, that's cool. the uh, I mean, that that's amazing that you just intuitively knew that. So. Um, I call it a memento mori, you know, mm. and, uh, but and not enough of us have that, that reminder that time's finite. And I think, yeah. um, not to use a bunch of geek psychology speak, but there's this concept called the hedonic treadmill. And so many of us just, 
think we're going to live forever. Right. Yeah. And when yeah. you can, even though that place is a little bit uncomfortable, I'm sure. Right. Cause it's a reminder like, Hey, I almost lost you. Right. That's right. That's not yeah. the best, but once you accept it, like, but it didn't happen. We're mm -hmm. here. Then you start to like every minute that you have here is a gift and you, you live it accordingly. But so many of us take that for granted, you know? Yeah, I really do. Um, and, and not alone that, cause I wanted to get your, you know, input because 2022 has been one of the, the most challenging years that, you know, I faced, uh, you know, career wise, I, I made some choices where, you know, I'm, I had opportunity to go up in the company, but you know, so much stress comes along with it, you yeah. know, I'm um, doing that. And, uh, unfortunately I adopted a group that wasn't, uh, groomed well. And so there's a lot of, a uh, lot of things that I have to do. You know, so I'm spending long nights at home just working. This is nights away, you know, from my wife, my kids, you know, I'm having to focus on trying to get this done because the job is so challenging. You know, we're, we're facing this uh, unfortunate thing with the studio where we literally like no one knows this, but, you know, we're we're literally getting, you know, kicked out. Someone bought the whole block. So you're dropping that right now for the first time? For the first time. Oh, yeah. My goodness. They right. bought the entire block. So and increased the rent for the space for like six thousand dollars. And who going to have uh, the money to pay for that? So yeah. and I, I know that's intentional because they just want us out of here to do whatever they want to do with the space. Uh, you know, things with my, my family, we face so many struggles, uh, even with the family, like, like dealing with outside dynamics, uh, even, you know, closer family members, just, you know, yeah, yeah. things just happening uh -huh. like we never faced before. Like we had so like in, in my marriage, like it's been like, I can't think of how great it's been, but this one year we faced so many different challenges from different, uh, avenues. So, you know, from a uh, point, of, uh, point of view of, like, mental hygiene and, you know, psychological things, how can we create a fun habit, you know, in situations like that when you're dealing with so much? Yeah, so I think, you know, it's really trying to figure out how you can control that time, right? And so there are things that you're going to need to deal with, right? In the book, I look at kind of classifying time in four quadrants and mm -hmm. I, everything you just described. So real quickly, the model is called the play model, pleasing, living, agonizing, and yielding. And w we don't need to get into the four categories, but mm -hmm. agonizing obviously can't yeah. make sense, right? It's <laughs> anything that sucks the life out of you and, but that you might have to do, right? right? Because where toxic positivity comes in is someone that's like, oh, it's all going to be okay, right? Like, mm -hmm. you know, your wife potentially dying, that's not going to be yeah, you know, right. I don't know if I can. You can say no, that. Oh yeah, yeah. We, we, get, we go, we go all the way there. Yeah, you can. Uh, all right, <laughs> but right, like that's not. You know, you're not gonna fix that with like good days only. Right? right. So, you know, figuring out to what degree do I need to worry about these things, and then figuring out what's your transition ritual so you leave that, not necessarily leave it forever because you know it's gonna come back. Right. But you know, how can I deal with that? then and then leave it there until I need to think about it again. Mm -hmm. And so we call those transition rituals, right? Like I have this family drama, I need to deal with it in, in whatever form that is. But then when it's over, I'm going to leave that. And then, you know, especially with family stuff, like how much of this is just relationships of convenience that if I really look at it, mm -hmm. it's just not serving me anymore, you know, and, and you cut it out. And yeah. so those things yeah. are heady things. You don't fix them overnight. Right. You know, this isn't trite advice. Right, right. But once you start to do that and then you start to realize that when I'm having a better time, I'm a better version of myself, mm -hmm. you know, especially for the ones that are there that aren't, you know, creating the drama. Right. Then, you know, it's, I'm not saying it gets easy, but it gets easier. Right. Is that helpful? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I mean, it makes sense. Um, yeah. And then with regards to work, I think it's trying to figure out what are the boundaries. Like, how has it, you should never spend every night till the end of the night working, right? So there's something problematic there. And, you know, mm -hmm. each person's situation is going to be different. Mm -hmm. But like, how much of that is admin time where if there was a way to either time block doing that, you know, in batches, right. you know, so that you're not task switching all the time. Right. Um, or is it just toxic enough that, you know, again, not something that you can fix overnight, but that right. needs to get fixed because it just doesn't suit, you know, where you are in life. And I know that, you know, there's a sliver of that that comes from a place of privilege. Some people aren't going to be able to mm -hmm. switch their jobs, right? And so, right, right. Um, but I think 
at any kind of social norm, there's a way to elevate your game. Right. And so Mm. looking at that critically. Yeah, for um, sure. Because, you know, like a good example is military dads or, you know, Mm. folks that are first responders where, well, you know, I have to go on deployment for six months. Like the last thing I'm going to tell you is like, Oh, well then just get out of the military. Right. (laughs) You know, so they're going to be constraints, but generally you can look at like, okay, what can I do with the time that I do have? Right. Right, So one of the first steps is kind of trying to identify, I generally like the frame of 168 hours because you know, that's what you have. That's how many hours you have in a week. Mm -hmm. And and you can usually go, you know, I can do the the work there. Right. Yeah. 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 So right. Yeah, I got a question, man. Yeah, please. You said something about, you know, people saying everything's going to be all right. I'm a person that says that. Like, <laughs> no matter what the situation is, you're like, it's going to be good. You know what I mean? Like, is that a bad habit? No, no, not have? necessarily. Where I would say it is if you, if his wife is in the ICU potentially dying and you say everything's going to be all right. Like, mm. that's where I'm going with that. There's some right. people that are like, so again, not to get, too much deep in the weeds, but I'm sure there's some psychologists that are listening. So we call it broad and build theory. And mm-hmm. like, if you just think that you, you know, you do want to have a bias towards thinking the world's good. Cause I think there's abundance of garbage and there's an abundance of good. And if you're always looking for it, you know, that's good where things go off the rails. And w- what I described what happened to me yeah. is if you always discount the bad, you know, because then all of a sudden that cognitive dissonance is going to, creep up on you right because mm. bad things are going to happen you're going so having a you know a mindset of positivity no that's not bad telling somebody that's going that's just lost a job or lost their parents like hey everything should be all right you know then that's bad and to unpack why that is real quick just so you, is that when motivation so that's kind of like a motivational approach right like mm-hmm. you're trying to convince them that things aren't bad right if that motivation doesn't hit where they're at because they're not ready to hear it it can turn into guilt and that's then you're potentially doing harm so i think that's the kind of extra step you want to take like is this person ready to receive this message right. or do they just need my empathy like right you know in the case of potentially you know having a partner that could lose their life they just need my hug and then when they're ready to receive my message I can come with that positivity and, 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 you know, be that, that person that helps lift them up. But I got you. I you got know, you. it's situationally appropriate. And when it's not, it, it does do harm. So I hope that's helpful. Oh yeah, definitely. Yeah. Definitely. And when it comes to, um, like the workplace, like the work life balance, like some people are just stuck doing what they doing and they don't have time to do anything else. Uh, they might have a bunch of kids, you know, a bunch, bunch of diff- different things. How can they like actually incorporate time to have fun? You know what I mean? Because if they're working 70 hours a week at Pizza Hut, you know what I mean? And and they come home to four children, like where can they fit that in? Yeah. You know what I mean? I think it's a matter of reframing. So one, what are you doing with the pockets that you do have, right? So mm-hmm. are you recapturing your lunch or are you just kind of like again you, you don't have the kind of vigor that's like even just even if it's just reading a book or connecting with someone that you like like instead of just sitting in the break room you know kind of waiting for that time to pass mm-hmm. how can you recapture just a little bit of it so that you know you are slowly but surely building that resilience and then how can you make the time you know like with your kids or your partner you know again we have 168 hours so even someone i mean i would posit if you're working 70 hours a week you know that's tough right it's like a lot of hours. yeah yeah so but there's still you know 98 out of there that you can control right and again hopefully you're sleeping 60 but so there's still you know a good 30 40 hours that you you have some agency and control over and so the first step is where can i start to apply just the you know i call it taking time off the table for myself right right like just start with one or two hours, whatever that is. And if you're from a place where, well, I'm a parent and I want to be there for my kids, then figure out what will be fun for all of you to do. You know, tired parents so often are just like, you know what, I'm just going to go to the park. And then what happens is they watch their kids play, but they just sit on the bench and kind of doom scroll on Instagram. Yeah. Right. What is, what are some activities I can co-create with my kids, you know, so that I'm actually enjoying it too. Right. And even just that subtle shift, like, 
you know, and it doesn't necessarily have to cost money, you know, especially we live in a beautiful place, right? With Greensboro, there are things Mm -hmm. all the time happen downtown. You know, what can I do that like, you know, reconnects me with something that I like, maybe that's music, maybe that's, you know, some sort of cultural fair, whatever Mm -hmm. it means to you, you know, just recaptures some of that. So you're right. You know, again, it's why, you know, preference like, you know, some people are living a hard life. Right. And so, Mm -hmm. You know, it, it's going to require levels. Yeah, you know, time right? management and planning is is really key. I mean, yeah. I literally just had a conversation with my wife because, you know, when you had kids, sometimes your your life will can easily shift to revolving around them. Absolutely, as it, so, <laughs> so she will. She's a great planner, but she she planned family trips and whatnot sure. for the family months out. But you know, throughout all those family trips, she was she came to me a couple times, and I heard her, but I didn't hear her it wasn't seeking yeah, yeah. in but you know she was saying like okay we're doing this family stuff but what about us yeah, you, know, yeah, you yeah. and i so we had that conversation where i had that epiphany i'm like i've been tripping like she's been telling me in so many words but what she's basically trying to tell me is look i can handle the planning the family stuff that's enough for me like it's a that's a lot to do why don't you plan us yeah yeah you know what i mean sure call about that time for us like i need to start putting in the future, like planning, just like she planned out months in advance trips for the kids. I can plan out a, a date for a few hours out of a day or something yeah, yeah. for us, you know, and I got to get, get, you know, better with those type of things. Yeah. And I think, as, you know, uh, there's been a lot that's come out even in the recent weeks about that, you know, that connection to, on multiple levels, right? One for men in particular, mm-hmm. reconnection with your partner and then also just with your friends and so how do you start that? I think, you know, when we talk to you know, the folks that are close to us, hey, you know, I really want, I don't know how you feel, but I really want to connect with my partner. Mm-hmm. Is there a chance like we could do a child swap? Because, you know, mm-hmm. yeah, mm-hmm. another thing that's kind of <laughs> makes us resistant to that, right? Is like, you know, it, it, if I don't do that, that extra hundred dollars for childcare, like puts a a big burden right yeah. on that the night out with your partner. So, right. you know, uh, one of the strategies I've found is who can I connect with on my block and say, Hey, I would like to give some time back to you on your calendar. I'm already watching my kids. Could we swap, which is like a, it generally, you know, for most kids and, and most adults creates an amazing win, win, especially if the kids are a little bit older, right? The kids have more fun, which takes pressure off af- actually having to watch them, especially mm-hmm. if you just have an activity, and then you lose, and then you're scheduling the time with your partner, right? Because you're like, you yeah. know, when this is going to work. Because unfortunately, yes, we all want that spontaneity back, right? With our relationships, but it's hard, man. Yeah, once you yeah. have kids, so yeah. you got to be a little bit more deliberate about it. And mm-hmm. then there's that magic of like, hold, I just put money back in my pocket too, because I'm not having to get a sitter. And you can right. use that to, you know, like going on a little date or something. Yeah, you yeah. Know? Good See, time out. Uh, what? You know, people can do like I do. You know, I got my father-in-law staying at the house. You know, I just leave with him. You know what I'm saying? Just do what I want to do. Yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. Me and the wife, we just Well, and that's even here. better because, like, again, there's there's rich studies that show that's what they were meant to do. Yeah, I meant it's kind of geeky neuroscience, but, you know, grandparents, like, you know, cortisol is released. It's like, there's a lot of magic happens when they're watching their kids, especially yeah. if they don't feel like, mm. you know, it's a burden. Like, you know, you get a little ahead of it. Like, Hey, do you mind doing this? And right. they, you know, they say yes. Like, yeah, I mean, it's good for all involved. You know, it's pretty healthy. So that's, yeah. a, that's, I mean, and what an amazing resource, it right? makes yeah. life a lot. Oh, yeah. sure. that's amazing. <laughs> yeah, but everybody don't have that. I don't yeah. have that. You know, but, you but uh, my moves. grandma lives Listen. up the street, um, what, far, yeah, not far right. from us. So that's far fortunate. Um, but, it's definitely not the same as them being in the house. You know what I mean? Yes. And then her grandmother, she's very involved in community. So uh, she does a lot of stuff with domestic violence and she's a counselor. So she's super busy. She's, sure, sure. She's got this whole movement. Um, but I want to come bring it back to the um, book for a moment because I know there's a section in your book where you was talking about, like you did a Ironman marathon or something like that. Yeah, yeah. Now, I don't know if you guys know, but look, this is what a, this competition consists of. Let me know if I'm off on anything now. For my research, this consists of a 2.4 mile swim, 112 mile bike run, and a 26.2 mile run. Now, are those measures That's right, sound yeah. about right? And now, my 26 question: 26 miles for people that know is a marathon. So essentially, you finish this off with a marathon. Jesus, like that's crazy. <laughs> now, how in the world did you build your mind and your body to do something like that? And 
How did it impact your life afterwards? The Highest Point Podcast. More than a pod, it's a lifestyle. lifestyle, lifestyle.